Are you looking to grow your product sales with specific retailers? Do you wish you had store level information about your products? What if there was a way to make sure your next product launch was a success? Social Nature is here to help. Social Nature is an all-in-one shopper marketing platform designed to help emerging brands win at retail. Powered by 1 million natural shoppers, they help you move units off the shelf quickly and get you the store-level insights you need to scale your business. If you're looking to grow at retailers like Whole Foods, Sprouts, Kroger, HEB, Wegmans, Walmart, and more, email marketing at socialnature.com or visit business.socialnature.com to learn how. And make sure to mention hearing this message on the Startup CPG podcast. That's business.socialnature.com or the link is in the show notes. It's always nice to start off with hearing, oh, I was in your store. That's one take that I want to listen more. You know, this is what I'm selling. Here's my why. You know, here's where I see myself on the shelf. Here's some of the success I had. And maybe you, you don't have success yet. You could ask for some help too and direction. Welcome to the Startup CPG podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Freitag. This is the first episode in our new Buyers series, and today we're joined by Mitch Orlan, VP of Merchandising and Procurement at EarthFair. EarthFair is a health and wellness supermarket with 20 locations in eight states in the Southeast US. Mitch has deep food industry experience, including being a restaurant owner and former executive chef at EarthFair, and he now manages a 12-person merchandising team at EarthFair. Listen in as Mitch shares about how EarthFair's product submission process works, including category reviews, best practices for engaging with buyers from email content to follow-up timing, how brokers add value for buyers, different models for distributing to EarthFair from self-service to local distributors to UNFI, best practices for promoting with EarthFair, educating employees and in-store demos, how and when a brand's on-shelf performance is evaluated by the EarthFair team, industry trends that Mitch is seeing right now, and more. And stay tuned at the end of the episode for a story from Startup CPG founder Daniel Scharf about recently getting into Earth Fair with Machu Picchu. And thanks to Mitch for that great idea. He wanted you all to hear from a brand that recently worked with Earth Fair in addition to his own perspective, which I thought was really helpful. Now let's hear from Mitch. Hi, Mitch. Welcome to the show today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah, so glad you're here. And would love if you could start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about EarthFair. Sure. Uh, I'm Mitch Orlan. I am the Vice President of Merchandising and Procurement for EarthFair. I've been in the food, natural food industry for most of my life. Uh, My dad had a restaurant growing up. I put myself through college with my own delivery business called Dr. Bagel. Um, I went to Natural Gourmet Chef School, and that was really cool in New York City. It's the only accredited natural food chef school in the country. And then I had my own restaurant. I worked in the food co-ops, and then I started my journey in the uh, supernatural industry with wild oats if you remember them from back in the day who whole foods bought and i was worked my way up from being in the store to store director to new store team then i ran the food service over there as the executive chef and vp of food service and then whole foods bought them then i went to sunflower market who was the original owner of Wild Oats. And then he went to do other things. So that's actually when I went came to Earth Fair for the first time. So Earth Fair has been around since 1975. And uh, I've been here for both rides. And I'm also very into the environment. So I started an nat- environmental company called Public Lands Watch of Northern Colorado. I'm on the board of Natural Biodiversity Project. And I'm also on the board of Asheville Community Yoga in town here. In between all that, I had my own award-winning restaurant restaurant in Asheville called Binberry Bond, home of real feel-good foods. And we had a top-end restaurant with no sugar, no wheat flour, and all clean meat. So that was pretty unique. And then uh, kind of delve into the Earth Fair, how our stories parallel. So Earth Fair has actually been around since 1975. A lot of people don't know that. Um, we started in Asheville with one store, small, 1,200 square foot, you know, mostly bulk with the original owner, Roger Duro, and then gradually grew kind of slowly, but, you know, 
grew to 10 stores, 15 stores. A couple of different venture groups got into Earth Fair, went all the way up to 50 stores. And in 2020, February, they actually went bankrupt. So Earth Fair was out of business for a couple of months. And then the new local owner and some of the original investors, Roger came back, Mike Centrillo, who's was the CEO back in the day. They're all investors. And then Dennis Holsing, who's a local businessman, bought it out of bankruptcy. We were just going to do three stores. Then it was eight. Then it was 12. And we just kept seeing the opportunity. So we ended up opening over 20 stores in an 18-month period. Um, so 2023 is kind of the year where we're kind of getting all our operations together, really getting our feet under us, able to pay more attention to the stores and also the the brands and uh, you know so far it's a great year so you know we're really excited to be back to have focus and uh, you know to be be different in the industry Earth Fair one of the first stores I, you know we're about average twenty thousand square feet we're full service you know we say we read the labels so you don't have to so we were one of the first stores in. 1998, we we banned high fructose corn syrup. And then in 2002, we banned trans fats. Then we got rid of artificial flavors and artificial colors. So we're kind of a leader in the industry on standards. And then I'd say the other piece that sets us apart besides our name, Earth Fair. So we're we're very sustainable. It's a great month, Earth Month. But also, we actually still make stuff. So we really set us apart by we make our hot food, we make our deli food. We're one of the only stores I know of, definitely in the Southeast. We make scratch organic bread. We actually cut meat. We make sausage. You know, we do our cut fruit in-house. So that kind of sets us apart. And then, you know, we're very innovative and quick to market in our grocery and wellness areas because we can still be nimble with 20 stores, even though we're an anchor for UNFI. Atlanta, which is really helpful with helping brand. Yeah. I don't know if that was short, but there you go. No, that's awesome. That's great. I have not yet had the pleasure of going to an Earth Fair store, but that makes me want to come even more. It sounds like an amazing experience. And that's so awesome that your experience is kind of like you've kind of been part of the you know, you've been there for multiple iterations, like you're seeing now, like post kind of restarting the the chain again. So that's, that's really interesting. Like what, what does your role look like today? Kind of like, what does a day in a life, lo- you know, look like for you now? Um, well, I got 12 people on my, on the merchant team. So, you know, there's a lot of what are we doing to innovate? What are we doing with the brands? You know, m- one-on-one meetings with my team, doing store walks, getting out in the field, you know, overseeing the promotional calendar, sales initiatives. I, I'm getting used to not doing all the work and help having people help do the work and manage the work. So that's a good experience. And we have a great team, almost of my team, 11 of them, 10 of them have worked for Earth Fair in the previous iteration. And then the other two worked with me at Whole Foods. So it's great. We have everyone who came from the stores. We kind of know what we're doing as far as we're a store level up kind of company. We're not a corporate level down, which was one of the shortfalls of old Earth Fair. And, uh, You know, the rest of the day is kind of spent with things coming in and uh, working with the team and and, and vendors. Right. Yeah. And you you mentioned around, you know, 20, about 20 stores is I think that's across like eight different states, right? Like it's not (laughs) all in one state, right? It's a lot of states. Yeah. I mean, that's a blessing and a challenge, right? Especially as we'll get into it with distribution. Um, But most of our core stores are in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Virginia. So pretty much all of them are within a couple, three to five hours. Most are within two hours. Then we have a couple outliers in Ohio and Michigan and Florida. So what happened was during the pandemic, you know, we were only planning on three, then eight, then 12 stores. But after the bankruptcy, all these Earth Fair, they're all old Earth Fair sites besides one. But all these Earth Fair stores were open in these communities who wanted Earth Fair back. So we we were able to just make good deals on leases. Like we didn't have to buy any more stores. We just bought the first three and bring all these jobs back to the communities. And, you know, we kind of knew every store wouldn't work, but we wanted to take the chance on where we were. And we're, we're pretty excited about the stores we have right now. It, and 
especially the core one. But yeah, Earth Fair spread out. It was spread out. Lucky's got two spread out. Wild Oats got two spread out. So far, it's a common challenge in our industry of like not overstepping your distribution, I think is something you, you have to be careful of. But lots of opportunity out there. So it's hard to say no sometimes. Yeah. Well, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the assortment planning process and like especially, you know, our audience is primarily emerging brands. So for you and your team, like what does it look like, you know, to bring an emerging brand into the assortment? What's it like on your side? What's it like from the from the, you know, brand experience side? Yeah, I mean, emerging brands are a tricky one, right? Because we love them. You know, it's it's definitely what sets us apart, what sets our industry apart. And we can be nimble and innovative m- m- much more than some of the big guys where we can get someone in distribution, but we can move quickly if we need to. But on the other side of it, you know, we've got into a good discipline of category management. We have reviews. You know, it really helps. I used to really not like working with brokers when I was just on the food service side. I was kind of like, why do I need them? But really... They are a big advantage. I know it's tough for emerging brands to get them, but they really create relationships and get in front of our buyers. And then, you know, I would say have something innovative and different, and that's going to take the place of something out. Know where you're going on the shelf and, and what you're going to take the place of. Um, because, you know, it's got to be one in, one out. So really kind of do your homework, know what we're about. You know, if you can get in one of our stores, know our food philosophy. That's always a red flag if someone got some that doesn't meet our standards. And I'd say, you know, if you have a track record with someone, you know, obviously that is helpful. We do, you know, review the data, we stay on emerging trends. But I would say also, you know, local is important to us. So you got a much better shot if, you know, you're within 100 miles of one of our stores. I might be getting ahead of my your questions. But, you know, we do, we have the ability to bring someone in for one store, you know, as long as they have their plan together, you know, they know how they're going to distribute. They got their prices right. They have a plan of, of how it's going to be successful. So Right. And does that, are decisions made at the store level sometimes? Or is everything kind of going through one team to then decide like, okay, this would be a really good fit for this individual store? Or is it, yeah, I'm kind of curious how the decision making goes to decide like, okay, this is going to go in this one store or this is going to go in all stores? Yeah, well, that's a great question because we can do it all different ways. Um, you know, the the end of the rainbow is really, you know, all the stores, right? But you want to start setting yourself up for success. So, you know, if I'm talking to, we're out of Asheville, North Carolina. That's where our mothership store is. That's where the office is. We have quite a few brands that only service Asheville, North Carolina because they're local. They can come here. They don't even have the ability right now to go to other other stores. But those are the, the relationships we love to nurture. So there's some brands that just started with Earth Fair, like Hickory Nut Gap Farms is now one of the biggest regenerative meat companies in the Southeast. You know, Sunburst Trout is now a big trout company. Um, so these are brands like Bucci Kombucha. We were one of the first ones to carry them. They're national. So we like to start small and then grow them out. So that's that's one way. And then it also kind of depends on distribution, right? So most people can get to one store. It's the question of how you're going to get to more stores. You're going to deliver it? Are you going to get a distribution partner? So the I would say the stores will feed information to the merchant team. They won't decide as much, uh, but they will decide somewhat on the assortment they may carry from from that brand. Right. Okay. And l- you mentioned category reviews. Is that like, do you, is, are those annual or like, what's usually kind of the schedule like for your team? And do you, you know, what, what does the process look like during a during category review time, you know, and maybe walk us through an example category if you can? Yeah, well, we have, you know, for grocery specifically, they, they have a very organized category review calendar. You know, it's very simple slide with data. So you can reach out to us to get our category review schedule, but there's pre-work that goes into it. Um, but also, are you ready for category review? You know, might be another question. If you're emerging brand, you know, you may want to just talk to us, you know, let us know what you're thinking, what your abilities are. You know, I would try that and then also get into our category review schedule 
you know, we're, we're looking for you knowing as a brand, like your financials. So can we promote? What's our, where are we going to make money? You know, where's the bottom line where we don't want to put anyone out of business, but I always say it's actually easier to get on the shelf than stay on the shelf. So it's kind of like, what's your plan to stay on the shelf once you get on the shelf? That We need to hear that because we don't want to overextend anyone. And even for emerging brands, they really need a promotional plan. You know, what's the quarterly promotions going to be? What is the demos going to be? You know, how are you going to be successful when you get in the store? Do you understand the retail pricing landscape is very important for us? And, uh, you know, just I know emerging brands don't have a lot of data, but, you know, what data can be shared, even if it's a one store success story of you five extra unit volume, you know, over the first three months. It's great to see. Right. Yeah. And when brands like, you you know, you mentioned, you know, maybe reaching out before applying for like a formal category review. Is there anything when when brands are kind of first reaching out that, you know, that they can mention in their outreach that's helpful so that you can kind of decide like, oh, I, you know, are they ready? You know, some of the th- things you mentioned, like you know, data and financials, like what should they be including in their like initial outreach to you that like that you're like, oh, I love when, you know, is there anything you're like, oh, I love when a brand reaches out and I can just like, you know, have all the information. Is there anything that, you know, brands should know? Well, I'd say there's two things and it's pretty common in the industry. There's a one or two slide kind of, I won't call it a deck because it's one or two slides, but you would use for category review. That's got your item, your price, your cost, your distribution channel, your promotional swing, any data, what makes you different, your attributes. So that's kind of the boilerplate what you would do. But I would say if you're sending an email and you're trying to reach out and get some conversation going with one of our buyers, I mean, we're pretty nimble. We try to answer all the emails, but obviously there's a lot. So it's always nice to start off with hearing, oh, I was in your store. Tick. You know, that that's one tick that I want to listen more. And I have you know, this is what I'm selling. Here's my why, you know, here's where I see myself on the shelf. Here's some of the success I had. And maybe you you don't have success yet. You know, you could ask for some help too in direction. So Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is, you know, we work with UNFI, who them and K are the biggest distributors, you know, for natural foods in the country. But we also work with, in our area, it's P10, who's a regional Southeast distributor and Blue Mountain, they do a lot of our local, they do a lot of the emerging brands. So if you have a relationship with one of those distributors, that can really help you, you know, jump the line. Right. Yeah, that that was going to be one of my next questions was about distribution, since you mentioned being a, a UNFI anchor for Atlanta. Is that like, you know, what what does it kind of look like for, you know, what level are you looking for a brand to be at to, you know, to be an anchor for for them for UNFI, like, you know, versus like an emerging store that you're going to test in like one store? Is there anything that kind of makes the difference? You're like, OK, like we're going to, you know, we're going to be the one that helps bring this brand into UNFI. What are you looking for? Well, obviously some unique. We don't want me to, you know, is it on trend? Do they have the exciting mission? And then, like I had mentioned earlier, do they have their kind of financials flushed out and ready? You know, because as everyone knows, distributors will, what's the right way to say it? We'll claw back money <laughs> um, is a nice way to say it. Because, um, you know, they got to stay in business too. And I think having someone help you understand what that is going to cost you to go into Unify, to service 18 stores out of there. You know, that's just a start, right? You'll get other store, but they're going to want a, a free fill. You know, they're going to want a promotion plan. They're the, We're going to want to know how you're going to help us sell it demo, education webinars, what are you going to do to get our store teams excited? And then kind of get us excited about your product. I mean, that's really the main thing. And if it's a food product, it's got to taste great. I mean, it really all starts with taste. So that's kind of what gets me excited. And, you know, it needs to be kind of the word I like to use is craveable. It needs to make me want to come back for more. And I, it's yeah. kind of a hard question. I was in the pitch slam judge at Expo and, you know, I asked them, like, where do you see yourself on the shelf and who do you see yourself replacing and why? So if you can tell me this brand's been on the shelf forever, they have no innovation. Now look what my brand does. You know, I fit your store better. You know, not taking shots at someone, but just where do you go on my shelf and why is really important. Yeah, that makes sense. And 
You also mentioned earlier, like the value that brokers um, can have. And like you said, brokers, you know, can be sometimes out of the budget for an emerging brand. But I'm curious if you can expand a little bit on like how your team works with brokers, how that makes your experience better. Because I also just think it's helpful to know what, you know, what life is like as a buyer too, just to kind of understand and appreciate the other side of the table when you're pitching. So like, what does that look like? And how does it help when your team gets to work with a broker? Yeah, well, we have like 18,000 items, right? (laughs) In grocery, probably. And, you know, probably within that 6,000 brands. So there's no way we can meet with all of them. And the brokers really aggregate the information and the timing. So my merchants have really good relationships with our brokers, especially our main brokers. They have broker calls like, you know, he do- Zach, our grocery category manager, he has the slots on Wednesday and Thursday when he just has broker calls and they bring in all their different brands. And then, you know, if we're having an event or we need help, we can reach out to the broker community instead of trying to reach out to the brand community and they can really make things happen that way. So not only do they like know our system, they know our paperwork, they know what we're looking for, you know, they have our marketing spend and where we want to go with that. So, so they are very helpful in the grocery world, I would say. And it's important to my team once they get to a certain volume that that they have a broker because it, it's just kind of hard to deal with the one offs. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's I'd say it's worth the investment once you can make the investment. It, it, if you're ready to grow, they will help you grow. And I know there's some options for some emerging brands with different accelerators, and I, some of the big brokerages are putting new programs together for emerging brands. So I think there's venues there that they can use. Yeah. And if and if a brand, you know, if they don't have a broker and they're coming to you and they're getting set up, you know, you mentioned that maybe they're they're on the smaller side, maybe they're just in a couple stores or one store. Maybe they're but they're delivering themselves. Is there anything that you would be help like that you would want to you know mention or note of like oh this is really helpful when people are on, like when they don't have a broker that to help them walk through the paperwork or the onboarding process? Is there anything that is helpful for brands to know that can set them up up for success if they're going to kind of be self service and how they can best help your team? I would say there's two pieces to that right there's the ones that are so small they're just starting it's my carrot locks guy that started in Asheville, and he's just delivering the stores and he's getting the notes and bolts figured out and you know we'll help him with that paperwork the first time and you know try to tell him what we think the price should be to sell and how much he needs to promote and really the key for that especially the ones that are delivering to the stores is demoing and education since they're local too, is really important. We have a, a Jun tea, you know, it's a kombucha made from green tea and honey and Shante Jun, it's called. She's local. She's totally grown her business with us. She started with nothing then started at Asheville. She's in about eight of our stores. She still delivers direct. She wants to save the money of distribution, but all we have to say is Shante, come do a demo and she's on it. She always leaves product for the store team so they know what it tastes like and they sell it. And we ever have an event, they come to it. So just being really involved and ready to do that grassroots kind of stuff with us. You know, we love that. There's lots of opportunity for that. And then phase two is get in with a small regional distributor. You know, that's really the next best step or even the first step if you're ready. And they will help you with the paperwork. They will help with logistics. They will help understand what we need, you know, on the promotional schedule and all those types of things to be successful. So I would say those are the first two steps. You know, sometimes you can skip the first one if you're ready. You know, it's usually farmer's market, selling in my house to somebody, farmer's market, delivering to the store, local distribution, get into UNFI or KE, or we also use GFI on more of the specialty side of things. So right. It's kind of okay. the, the evolution of a brand's life into distribution. Hey there, this is Kim on the Startup CPG team. Did you know that over 70% of in-store promotions are not effective? and over 80% of brands will fail while promoting at the shelf, but you have to run promotions with retailers. So what's the solution? Thankfully, Promomash, the only all-in-one promotion management platform, and Crisp, a leading retail data platform that integrates with over 40 retailers, 
have developed a joint solution that gives CBG brands a level of visibility and control they've never had before over their trade spend and promo performance. A free 30-day risk-free trial is available exclusively for Startup CPG members. Just go to promomash.com slash Startup CPG. Promomash is spelled P-R-O-M-O-M-A-S-H. To see for yourself what more effective promotion planning looks like, that's promomash.com slash Startup CPG or the link is in the show notes. Are you looking to get your products in front of 17,000 foodies? Consider exhibiting at the IFT First Conference, happening in Chicago, July 16th through 19th. The expo is put on by the Institute of Food Technologists, IFT, and filled with buyers, investors, product developers, research and development professionals, and innovators. There will be a startup pitch competition giving away $15,000 in prizes, plus 100 scientific panels, more than 800 exhibitors, plus the Startup Pavilion featuring 100 food and food tech startups. Booths in the Startup Pavilion are affordable at just $575. The theme of this year's IFT First is Innovation in a Time of Crisis. Can we future-proof the food system? To learn more about IFT First and how to get a startup kiosk, Go to iftevent.org. That's I-F-T as in Institute of Food Technologists, iftevent.org. And the link is in the show notes. And you mentioned also like, you know, getting the store teams excited about the product. And I'm curious, like, you know, sounds like coming into the store and demoing and make sure to like leave the product you know, for the store teams, what else helps, you know, educate the store teams about new products? What can emerging brands share? Like, you know, can they send samples to all stores or like, what's the best way to make sure that the store teams feel excited and like they know, you know, know about the product? Yeah, samples are great. You know, swag is great. We're okay with that. You know, samples, demoing, and when they're in the store, connecting with the teams and leaving samples. You know, they can, we let them leave coupons too. You know, the other thing we're doing that's pretty cool is not only are we have, we do education where they can do, you know, a a webinar or teams meeting about their brand. What, you know, we call it wellness, but vitamins and body care. They have one like every other week because that's really important, the education on that side. Um, But we did just did this great cheese training, you know, over video where they sent the cheese to the stores and did a tasting with it. So that that was great training. Um, The other thing we're doing, it's called the Fresh Forum. And it's a monthly webinar for the public too that tells about a brand. So we did Garden of Life the first week. We did Solgar, I believe, and then Nordic Natural. And then this month is really cool. We're doing actually grass-fed beef. You know, is gonna we're gonna come talk about that and why that's important for Earth Day. So I would say those are, are the main things for a young brand and to make those connections, you know, within the stores. Right. Yeah, that's great. All those programs sound super awesome. And that also kind of lends into, I'm curious, like on, you know, we, you mentioned uh, promotion planning. On the promotion planning side, like, are there any, like, are there, you know, annual sales or like any kind of special promotions that Earth Fair has that, you know, and, you know, a brand would learn during the application process. But I'm curious if you could talk through any kind of special promotions that the store do or, you know, and then what, it, how that can, you know, boost a brand to participate in some of those promotions. Like it sounds like you have different things going on for Earth Month. What are some other different promotions the store does throughout the, the year? Um, well, we have a kind of a themed calendar. So, you know, we feed into that, but we have kind of a a menu of things people can do we you know we have a a card and a marketing piece that shows it and it actually shows actually the great lift you get when you're on promotion but you know you could promote with us anyway from being in our flyer you know being on display being on an end cap cross merchandising you can do as a program you know we have digital marketing so instagram facebook we can do a recipe with you which is really cool. We've done it with some brands. And then, you know, then we have our calendar. So, you know, there's GMO week. So we did BOGO GMOGO. 
And then, you know, we have New Year, everyone does it, you know, healthy eating, wellness, we run really strong deals, we have a BOGO month, you know, there's a frozen frenzy promotion, we do a lot of events, so we run a grass-fed beef event, or we run a citrus event, tomato event, and you don't just have to be produce. If you have a product that fits and really cool, you can be in with that. And like, you know, recently we had a brand reach out to us. They had a new product. They wanted to get it in people's mouths. So we actually did, when you buy a chicken, we sell a lot of rotisserie chickens. On Monday, we have the chicken meal deal where you get a six ninety nine chicken. And this brand actually just gave us product. They were rice packs, you know, that you microwave for 90 seconds. And everyone who bought a chicken got one for free. And, you know, what a great way to get that in people's mouths to know the right people are going to get it. So we're pretty nimble with what we can do. And uh, I'd say those are some of the best things. We just brought on a small brand called Jam Bar. I don't know if you heard of them. The original woman founded Power Bars. Mm. And uh, really cool. It's about music. It's about athletics. And they've been donating. We do a lot of events. So 5Ks, we sponsor a lot of events and they've been given a lot of bars and that's just now they've went from one store to the 12 stores and they're really supporting us and we're supporting them we had a webinar about them you know they gave us a thousand bars for a big 5k so you know there's ways that you don't just have to spend money you know we can do with your product or, or with education that really helps but you know having it on promo when it rolls out having it at the right place and being able to do demos you know is really important once you get out of emerging and into happening every day then we expect more like 24 weeks worth of promotions and, you know, new innovation. And, you know, we love an exclusive if we can get one. We're not as big as some players that, you know, get a lot of exclusives. But, you know, we love to do that with small brands that the big guys are too big for that. So all those things work for us uh, really well. Yeah. Oh, that, that, those are all awesome. And are a lot of those opportunities planned in like a promotional calendar like once a year or are, is some of this like staying in touch with your team to find out like oh you know are you doing any 5ks in the next couple months or like you know how can a brand best kind of stay in touch to stay on top of what opportunities there are well there's kind of a plethora of ways i would say like so grocery you know plans much farther out than the other the fresh department so you could get in with them and get a promotional calendar for for the year. But then there's the other opportunities which will come up, which usually that's where it's good to have a broker sometimes. We'll send a blanket email. Hey, we're, we just did this. We had an anniversary event in our Knoxville store last weekend. The brands were so generous. We got tons of samples, special deals, you know, BOGOs, buy one, get, get two. So we did all kinds of promotions. It, that's not something that's planned way ahead. So that's something people can participate in kind of on the offshoot ask. But otherwise, we have promotional planning. We have a calendar. You know, we run a fly, digital flyer every week and fresh, you know, centers, grocery wellness will run it monthly. So we have a lot of opportunity to promote with us. And it, it doesn't always have to cost you a lot of money. And it's just kind of staying close to the buyer and being like, if you ever have an event, we'll send samples or we'll come demo. And we'd like to talk with your team about, you know, collaborating on a recipe, you know, then we'll put you with our marketing team and, and kind of go from there. Right. Okay, great. Never be scared to offer or ask. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. That's great advice. And on the in-store demo side, is there anything that you see either like best practices or even things that, you know, the store team doesn't like as far as like, if you're going to go in and do demos, like just curious if there's anything that really stands out when a brand comes in and you're like, oh, like we love working with this brand on demos. Like what can brands do to make sure that they're, they're providing really good demos on site, you know, in your stores? A couple of things. Well, you can't always have it, but it's great when the actual founder or people that work there at least do them. Like that's my preference. And they have good energy and they thought about their demo. It's not just bread and peanut butter. What's exciting about it? Are they going to do a nice simmer sauce, you know, on top of, you know, a sprouted grilled tofu strip? Like, so, you know, some creativity, some uniqueness. And then kind of knowing, like, bring your own product. Don't expect to take product off the shelf. And then communicating ahead of time. So we make sure we do have your product on the shelf when you're there demoing. and a case or two in the back. Um, so those are really important things. And, you know, maybe saying, hey, can I spend 15 minutes with the team while I'm here to kind of talk to them about my product? So I think 
we'll always give room for that also. And yeah. obviously clean. One time, I, these guys were in my store. They had the best intentions, but he was in there, you know, with his brand shirt but it was like a tank top you know not really f- food safe and he was super energetic but i was like i don't need to see the guns man it, it's cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's funny so have fun but be professional how's that yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah no that's great i like that and like you know how if if you're doing you know demos like are generally do you see brands being the most successful if they're you know contacting stores directly saying hey i'm gonna be in in a week you know like you know to do a demo like you know what how do you see brands best communicate with the stores to prep for a demo well you need to really work through your buyer um and then he'll guide you or she will guide you through the process but it kind of starts with working with your buyer like we're doing one right now a company out of Asheville called dairy cheese and it's a plant-based cheese it's it's amazing very like micro craft like the next level of plant-based cheeses, but it's a lot of logistics because she's in distribution with P10. You know, we got to make sure her product's on the shelf. She's got to make sure she can get there. Does she have the marketing material? You know, my buyer, Stephen, had to send an allocation of two cases to each store to make sure they had the product. So there's a lot of back and forth and logistics. So, you know, work with the buyer and the buyer will guide you and then he'll get you in touch with the stores. And then the stores love to hear from, you know, the brands and the founders and the people actually, you know, doing the work. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, you mentioned uh, earlier also that, you know, a lot of times the hard part is getting off the shelf and I'm curious, like how often your team is evaluating, like, you know, say you a a brand gets set, it's new on your shelves. You know, how often are you evaluating like "Mm, that brand is not moving enough or wow, like that brand is just like selling through, you know, like crazy. What does it look like for your team to evaluate how a brand's doing and how can brands best like check in during the, you know, after they've sold in to say, hey, how, you know, maybe they don't have access to data yet. So how's our sell through looking? What can we do? You know, how, how what does it look like to kind of partner on the getting off the shelf and for your team to track that? Well, it's a little trickier for emerging bands, right? So, you know, we use, we're in spins, you know, we like spins, we use a lot of that data, you know, we do our own category reviews, you know, I would say once you got in and you got on the shelf, you have your promotional plan in place, you know, you've done your due diligence of what's the right price, what's the right retail, you know, we need at least 90 to 180 days to kind of see if something's working or something's not. 90 is probably too little unless it's one off in one store. And, you know, we'll do a, sometimes a mini reset or a mini category reset if we see some slow or something else is really fast and it needs more space. So I would say, you know, no f- sooner than three months, but we'd like to see if something's working or not by six months. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. And do you, do you see like how is the best way for brands to stay in touch on like kind of their performance and kind of get a pulse on, you know, if, you know, their performance is maybe lower than, you know, what you all expected and you're going to be looking at placing someone in their, their place so that, so that there's no surprises, like how can brands best stay in touch and know where they're at and know when to like, you know, pull more levers and be like, oh, okay, you know, let's do some more demos. How can they be good partners? I mean, I think it's, you know, having an inquisitive mind and asking the right questions and checking in with with our merchants, you know, and working on a plan. Obviously, if they can't get into spins data, I mean, if we ran a promotion with them, we, we can give them the data and let them know how it did. You know, we're willing to, we're small enough and nimble enough, we, you know, we can pull those reports. I can't do it for 300 brands a week, but emerging brands, we like to help them with that. And we can help them with their promotional plan and what we think the right price is or the right multiple, you know, or what the right options are for them. So I would just say it's mostly staying in touch with us on that. And when you stay in touch, so be come with the, like you said, okay, we had a promotion. How did we do? How could we do better? You know, I want to do another one. What do you suggest? Not just like, you know, oh, I'm in your store. How are my sales? Oh, thank you. You know, like have some questions that are going to make sense to take it to the next step. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Um, 
And and then what do you look for to, is it monitoring the spins data or what do you kind of look for to expand a brand into multiple stores if they've started in just a couple? Is it looking at the data? Is it looking at how the brand is supporting sell through with demos or, you know, or a combination? I'm curious what it looks, you know, how long it kind of takes for you to decide to be like, okay, this brand is doing really well. Now we're going to put it in 10 stores or all 20 stores. Yeah, I would say again, kind of that 90 to 180 day rule, three to six months. Like if it's really hot and it's in a couple stores and within 90 days, you know, it's knocking it out of the park, then we can expand. As you probably know, or or brands know, it's not a quick process to get a brand uh, item going. (laughs) <laughs> right. So it could take three months, six months once you get the yes. So, you know, we can move pretty quick, but then it's going to kind of depend on distribution. Again, the small distributors are more nimble. They can move pretty quick setting up a new item. The benefit of UNFI, you know, it's, even if you have an item number, it still could take three to six months to actually get to our shelves. So, you know, we got to be thinking ahead about that and, and looking for the innovation and getting in front of it. Mm-hmm. So I would say it's a combination of what Like you said, it is a combination. Okay. And when brands are are reaching out to, you know, they're, you know, they want to submit for a category review, but they're reaching out kind of outside the category review. Is there anything, you know, you mentioned some kind of best practices earlier as far as like content of emails. I'm curious about like cadence of timing and follow-ups. Like, you know, do you see, are there brands that follow up too often and you're like, oh, like hold your horses, like, you know, we'll get back to you. Are there brands that you're like, man, we haven't heard from them for months. Like what's kind of an appropriate cadence for follow-up just in checking in with your buyers that like, that's a good fit for your team. If they haven't heard back, you have a pretty small, nimble team, but kind of curious what like feels best for your team there? I would say, you know, if you're on the sales side, it's like a a maybe is a yes, a no is a maybe, right? So um, it's kind of touchy because every buyer is different. You know, some just want them on schedule and, you know, we'll, we'll look at something and be like, okay, I don't want this. Here's my category review. There's other buyers where they have a little more empathy. They might have smaller categories they manage, so they might communicate back and forth more. Um, I would say, you know, once you reach out, you know, and if you don't hear back, you know, you can follow up in a week. If you do hear back and then there's a conversation, you know, you you feel out what that looks like. But if you start emailing people more than it once a week, then I think, you know, you're going to turn them off. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's always great to get, you know, going back to what before, like if you can get, even if the, the store wants to bring you in, that's a great start. So if you're in one store and you're doing, make sure you really create that, treat that as your firstborn and you know, really get that one going, then the store will tell us, you know, so I think that's a good trick. And then once you get in one store, or two stores, you just keep that momentum going. And then, you know, the groundswell will usually happen. Right? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, And then you've mentioned a few like products that you're excited about. And it seems like Earth Fair is really tuned into a lot of trends or even, you know, helping, you know, Uh, create some trends like are there any trends right now just I'm curious that like you're excited about or you're excited to see more of like what's kind of top of mind for you on the trend side yeah I'd say a couple things like and I'm glad to see it's finally like hitting mainstream Expo West floor like the upcycle community and new brands. I mean, that's really exciting. That's something we stand for that we've kind of been doing the whole time. And, you know, we we have a program that's called Save and Stop the Waste. So any product will get, you know, a, a special tag, if it's got a bruise on it, we'll sell it for less money. We'll cycle it down, you know, and just have it on a great deal the last day of its shelf life. So we're trying to create ways not to put stuff in the landfill, just like these brands are doing now. So really exciting, you know, to work with them. We take our, we're one of the only organic juice bars still out there and we don't use any ice. So we take, as you know, those juicers, you get all those vegetables left over that got extracted. We have different local farmers that come in for the compost. So we love doing stuff like that. So I'd say upcycling. The other thing I'm really excited about, like especially like Walk and Expo this year, is I feel like plant-based is getting to a new level of kind of like craft-based, plant-based, kind of like microbreweries came on after regular beer. Like 
it's the era of the microbrewery of plant food. So saw some amazing products there. And, that you know, again, they got to taste great. And they really are starting to taste and get that texture, the smaller ones. So that's a big push for us. Sustainability, what are you doing around sustainability is a big trend. Um, functional beverage is a big category for us that's really taken off. We saw a lot of single serve functional beverage. That's really exciting. Um, you know, diversity in brands, women-owned, is re- is really important for us. Um, we just did a big Women's Month. We had an end cap of just women's products, and that was really exciting. And, and I'd say for us, it's also value, right? Like, how do we partner with brands to create, you know, a value perception that's a win-win on both sides? I mean, that's kind of old school, but it's kind of where retailers are needing to go right now with, you know, costs going up and units going down. We need to partner with people on ways to get units up. So I'd say value is really important these days. And, uh, you know, and also in like our fresh departments, we do a lot of grass fed beef, wild fish. You know, what can we do that's unique? Uh, Force of Nature is a new brand we've been working with. I don't know if you've heard of them. Regenerative, mm-hmm. you know, meat there. The pigs are actually feral pigs pigs that you know are invasive and that they use in their in their meats and their sausage and that's been an awesome brand for us it's really blowing up so i think stuff that's unique like that that works toward with sustainability but also is healthy you know is really exciting and we do we probably sell the most grass-fed beef of anyone per location probably in the country kind of a value for us that is also healthy so those are some of the things um I just like things that taste great too. So I, I think seaweed is another one that's starting to see the light. Like I've always loved sea vegetables, cooked with them, you know, my whole career, but now they're starting to come on, which is really exciting. Different applications. They're they're super food that a lot of people don't know about. So I think that's a sleeper for for this year. Yeah. Oh, those are great. Thank you for sharing those. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to share before we wrap up? No, I'm just really excited for our industry and, uh, you know, helping brands where we can, seeing the innovation. And the, you know, that's where it all starts. And that's where Earth Fair started, you know, just a little store, 1,200 square feet, you know, way back in the day. So, you know, we, we feel like we're nimble enough and, and small enough to, to make things happen quickly, but we're big enough that we can really help a brand, you know, be successful, you know, in, in their growth. Yeah. Awesome. And if a brand feels like they um, they might want to reach out to your team is all the information on the Earth Fair website um, to, to reach out to your team or what's the best place to find the up-to-date intel? Yeah, they should go to the website and, and there's a contact us area where then we could feed them category review process, the, the marketing, you know, we call it a menu of how they can work with us and, and all those different things. Perfect. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, I'll include that link in in the show notes. Well, thank you so much, Mitch. This has been awesome. It's been really great to learn more about Earth Fair and your experience and just how you know brands can best partner. This has been so helpful. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. Don't go anywhere just yet. Stay tuned to hear from Daniel Scharf about his experience of getting Machu Picchu into Earth Fair. Hey, this is Daniel. I'm the founder of Startup CPG and also the CEO of Machu Picchu Energy. Uh, It's amazing that Mitch came on and gave all that incredible detail. And I just wanted to add my personal experience with Earth Fair. We're super excited to be launching six SKUs with them um, in, in April of 2023. The submission process for us was pretty straightforward and simple. Um, You know, with our broker, we submitted a PowerPoint that had a brief summary of the brand, our SKUs uh, with a ranking, and our promo plan, as well as performance data from the market. Um, They also shared pretty cool marketing options that included customer demographics, marketing program options from social media to TV or in-store displays and demos, then had the lift data for each of those things as well. So helped us make some decisions. Um, So pretty, pretty awesome. And we were really excited. We actually submitted in February and already got orders starting the second week of April. So that's lightning fast in my experience. Experience and we're super excited to be in the Earth Fair stores. We're going to run uh, demos and just make sure we absolutely crush it with them. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening in today. I'm so honored you joined me for this conversation and I love hearing from you all with feedback, suggestions, or if you just want to say hi at podcast at startupcpg.com or you can find me on LinkedIn. 
If you liked this episode, we'd love for you to share it with a friend or colleague, subscribe so you don't miss future episodes, and maybe even leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you aren't yet in our Slack community of founders and experts, we'd love to see you there. You can get the free invite at startupcpg.com and find all our other awesome resources there like webinars, databases, the blog, the magazine, and virtual and in-person events. And if you found yourself rocking out to our intro and outro music, which I do every single time, make sure to check out the Super Fantastics on Spotify. It's the band of our Startup CPG founder, Daniel Scharf. I'm Jesse Freitag, your host and producer. And on behalf of the whole team at Startup CPG, thank you for being here and see you next week.